so I consider this series as preparatory for the lectures of Farg and Schulze on their program. And um, the story is going to begin with, well, maybe there will be some overlap with Ji Wei's talk on Stuckers. So I just wanted to review the situation with function fields and Stuckers before trying to carry it over to the case of a piatic field. So let's return to Drinfeld's Stuckers. Well, why define such things at all? Because we're interested in the Langlands program. In this context, let's say x is going to be a curve over fq, so I want this to be projective and non-singular and geometrically connected. And let's say k is its function field. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to construct the Langlands correspondence for k. Uh, let's just consider the group GLN over k for now. So these will just be GLN stuckers. So the method here employed by Drinfeld and then Lafour is to consider the cohomology of some space of Stuckers. So whatever Stuckers are, their moduli space might have some interesting action of a Galois group, but then also um, an adelic group. And then in cohomology, that might manifest the correspondence. Uh, and then the inspiration, I suppose, An automorphic form for GLN over a function field would be a function on some double coset space like this. So I could take GLN, G is GLN, uh, GLN of the Adels, modulo G of K, but then also modulo G of all of the ring of integers. And unlike in the number field case, this has a very concrete interpretation as the set of isomorphism classes of vector bundles on the curve x. So I might write that as saying, well, we could say like let bun n be the moduli stack of vector bundles of rank n on the curve x. And if I evaluate this on fq, I just get vector bundles on x, base changed to nothing. And then if I just take the points of this stack, this is what this is. So functions on this are automorphic forms. So it makes sense if I want to kind of geometrize this situation and get something interesting, that vector bundles should be involved. So what are Stuckers? All right, so I'll just give you this review. Um, so let's let S over FQ be a scheme. Mm -hmm. And our definition. Uh, an X Stucke, in the sense of Drinfeld, over S of rank N. Um, so these Drinfeld Stuckers have two legs, so that's going to be part of the data. So I'm going to list some pieces of data for you. So I need two S points of X, so there's, these are going to be the legs of the Stucke. And then I also need a vector bundle. All right, so that stack classifies vector bundles on X. So its S points are vector bundles on the product X cross S. In other words, families of vector bundles on X parameterized by S. That's the other piece of data. And then finally, the last piece is going to be, um, well, it'll be a rational function, I suppose, from E to its Frobenius pullback. So let's do it this way. Frobenius pullback of E. 
So I'm just going to write a dotted arrow to mean something which is like an isomorphism everywhere, but on two divisors. And those divisors come from x1 and x2. So I'll just write f as an isomorphism away from two divisors gamma xi. And up here, I write what that means. Gamma xi is going to be inside of x cross s. It's going to be the graph of xi. xi is a map from s to x. x is a curve. So then this thing, this graph, is going to be a divisor on that curve. And so it makes sense for this function f to be well-defined everywhere but there. And then I need to impose some conditions to make it a shtuka in the sense of Drinfeld, which is that it has a simple pole at one of the x's, maybe x2, and a simple 0 at x1. So I'll just write it this way. 0 at x1 and a pole at x2. OK. So maybe in the course last week, more details were given on this definition and also much more of a generalization, too. I suppose this isn't quite enough for a Drinfeld Stucke, but if the legs are disjoint, then it actually is enough. So in this definition, what are we looking at? Certainly there are these legs involved. So an S point of a space of Stuckes must map to two copies of X. So let me just exchange these boards now. All right, now is this visible? Um, OK, is that all right? Then, um, mm -hmm. uh, if I were to consider the moduli stack of all of these shtukas, so it's going to be the data consisting of x1, x2, and e and f. And uh, let's call this Stuckas 2 um, for the group GLN. And then the other thing that would be required here would be a mu. And the mu specifies like to what extent do these, does the map f fail to be an isomorphism at the two points. So in this case, mu corresponds to mu1 and mu2. And mu1 and mu2 are co-characters of GLN. But this is what specifies a simple pole and simple 0. And this notation is meant to remind you of the notation for Shimura varieties, which also involve co-characters to write down. And so this moduli stack is certainly fibered over two copies of the curve x, because this map just sends you to the legs. I mean, you have x1, x2, e, and then f. This gets sent to x1 and x2. Okay. Um, Great, so we have this leg map. Um, we can add level structure to this situation, as you do with Shimura varieties. You add that level structure by trivializing the vector bundle at a divisor in a way that uh, avoids, that has to avoid the leg. And it's got to be compatible with the map F. So I won't write down every detail there. I'll just say you add level structure. Yes? There, I'll even write them down, yeah, I mean, because this was just sort of a review, I didn't write it down exactly. But, I mean, if I write down co-characters by non-increasing sequences of integers, then mu1 is this one, and then mu2 is this one. Yeah, so this is what's necessary to say simple zero and simple pole. Okay. Um, if we add level structure, Well, the level structures would be parametrized by adelic groups. So if I have a compact open subgroup of G of the adels of K, then I can define, I'll write it this way. Stuckas, 2, GLN, mu, and then I'll write u, indicating level u. But uh, everywhere where this u is not maximal compact, we have to remove the corresponding points from x. And so I think I'll just do something simple and just say this is defined over the generic fiber, sorry, the generic point the generic point of x, x2. So x cross x has some generic point, and then the residue field there would be the field that this is fibered over. So this is some stack. It's a 
a Deline Mumford stack. It's not a finite type, which is sort of a difficulty. Where am I writing next? I think I bring this up. This down. Mm -hmm. um. So one wants to study the cohomology of this tower of stacks of Stuckas. A priori, this is a representation of the Galois group of eta 2, this generic point. But um, owing to the existence of these partial Frobenius maps, I don't know if they were mentioned last week because I wasn't here. They were, fantastic. You actually get a representation of two copies of the Galois group acting on the cohomology of this. And so I'll just write down the outcome. Due to Drinfeld and Laforgue. This will be just in very impressionistic terms. Uh, the cohomology of the space of Stuckas. Are you phase changing to the geometric? Oh, yes. So, what I'd better do is say here's eta 2, and let's take the geometric generic fiber over x squared, and then also take a limit. And, uh, but there's other things one must do as well because this is, fails to be a finite type. So this is, you know, one must have to pass to some kind of cuspidal cohomology. But I'm going to just elide all of those details right now because I just want to give you the general impression. This thing is going to have an action of some interesting groups. One of them is G of A. And then you get two copies of the Galois group of K bar over K. And the way that this decomposes as a representation for those groups is like so. Well, I better say something about what I elided. So why don't I just say cuspidal? <laughs> the cuspidal part of this cohomology. So this is going to be a sum over cuspidal automorphic representations of G over K. On the one hand, we have pi. On the other hand, we've got the Langlands correspondent of pi. I was going to call that phi pi, but then I don't know, is there like the culture at this conference, how you call <laughs> the thing which corresponds to pi? How about that one? All right. And then I want the dual of it over here. Okay. Uh, right. So if I had chosen different values of mu here, I would have gotten different results over here. But with these simple values, I get these. All right. So the um, idea of Stuckas is that we have some space fibered over copies of x. Of course, in last week, you saw examples where it's fibered over arbitrarily many copies. Um, and then the outcome has something to do with the Langlands correspondence. So over here, I'll just write the dream is to define define Stuckas over number fields. I mean, even in a way which just replicates this picture. But um, the massive problem with this is that we don't know what spec z cross spec z is. After all, um, a moduli space of Drinfeld Stuck is in a number field setting should be fibered over x cross x somehow. But if x is spec z, we don't know what this is. Um, uh, what we do in this series is just say, um, well, we take this perspective of Schulze, which is to say, over a piatic field, we actually do know what to do. So over today and tomorrow, I address this issue. Can you say just a little more about what you mean? Because, of course, this product is naively defined over Z. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. It would be na naively. Of course, this product exists as a scheme. It's just spec Z again, but that's not good enough. You're certainly not going to get a representation of two copies of the Galois group of Q by considering something fibered over spec Z. So it has to be something else. All right. Well, we're going to start vague and then zero in on something actually concrete. But the idea is that, at least in the local case, 
it is known what to do now. Okay. Um, all right. So that's what I'll do just next. Any questions so far? Great. I'm stopping at 12, 25. Okay. Fontaine's A inf. So A inf is a, a stepping stone towards the way of answering the question, what is the product? So um, in response to the question that was just raised, of course you can take this product naively, but it just won't get you anything interesting. Um, All right. So, well, I'm just going to transport that expression over there, over here, but I want to do so in such a way that respects the fact that ZP is a topological ring. So instead of saying spec, I'll write SPF. We're in the category of formal schemes now, so I'm just remembering that ZP has a topology. And of course, I have to put scare quotes around everything. I mean, if this did exist, it would look something like this, where I take like a completed tensor product of two copies of ZP. But then naively, this is just ZP again, and that's the problem. If you think about why this is just ZP, it's because, well, the thing which generates the topology in this copy is the number P. and P tensor 1 in this ring is 1 tensor P. There's just no way around this. <laughs> I mean, philosophically, the problem is that P is a number. It's not a variable. <laughs> P is just sum of copies of 1. So you'll never get around this just by working naively. So the way one gets around this is to think of P more of a, or to somehow separate the two copies of P coming from the two um, factors in the product. And this was a theme in piatic Hodge theory for decades now, is that you need to have multiple avatars of the number p in the same situation. And where this is all going is vit vectors. So vit vectors is just the key to doing everything. So um, I'll just write here, you need vit vectors. So a proposed definition of such a product will have to wait. But at least when one of the factors is a perfect ring and characteristic P, we're going to proceed right now. So I'll just say this. If for R, a perfect ring of characteristic P, all right, so now I'm making a formal definition, which is that in these quotes, <laughs> um, R tensor ZP. will be defined as the ring of p-typical vit vectors for R. So R is a perfect ring of characteristic p. Its p-typical vit vectors are formal sums like so, where a n lives in R. And yeah, in a sense, this is like a formal power series with p as the variable. And so we're trying to address this issue here. Um, all right. So why is this a reasonable thing to do? Well, a tensor product should at least contain the two rings. And in this case, it contains one of the rings literally, and it almost contains the other. Of course, it does. It contains ZP. ZP being the bit vectors of FP maps into R, WR. And then R also maps into WR, but this is not a ring homomorphism. But it is a morphism of monoids, Mo multiplicative monoids. So 
So that's what this is trying to capture with this definition. Mm -hmm. um, I want to study a case where R is something very specific, which is to say I want R to be the ring of integers in a, the completion of an algebraic closure of QP. And then we'll arrive at Fontaine's ring A inf. So in essence, the goal today is for us to understand what a local Stucke is with coefficients in CP. And that's what we're going to try to do now. So um, let's let C over QP be complete and algebraically closed. So for instance, it could simply be the completion of an algebraic closure of QP. So this is going to have a ring of integers, I'll call it OC. And I'll continue with the notation over here. Let's let MC be its maximal ideal. And I want K to be its residue field, which will also be algebraically closed. Um, right. um, what I want to do next is to give a definition for OC tensor ZP. You see, I mean, R here was perfect ring in characteristic P. I ultimately wanted to find something like this, but neither of those rings are in characteristic P. They're all mixed. And I want to do something with this OC rather than something characteristic P. So to feed this into this definition of um, OC tensor ZP, I need to convert OC into something in characteristic P. And this process is this famous process of tilting. So I define the tilt of the ring OC as follows. Hmm. So there's two definitions, but they're equivalent. I'll give you the first. All right. Uh, so this is the OC flat or OC tilt is defined as a limit of OC mod P over where the transition maps are raising to the power of P. So that ring OC modulo P now is in characteristic P. Raising to the power of P is an endomorphism of that ring. And so it makes sense to consider all such, well, this would just be a set of all such sequences, you know. And this certainly is a ring. And furthermore, it's a perfect ring because you can undo raising to the power of P simply by taking such a sequence and shifting it over. So this is going to be a perfect ring of characteristic P. Um, slightly less obvious, but easy, is that this is simply the ring of integers of a different complete algebraically closed field, which we call CP. So, uh, sorry, C tilt. So this will be its field of fractions. <coughs> so like, uh, uh, like the field C, the field C tilt is an algebraically closed valued field. So this construction goes back to Fontaine. Well, it's a complete. valued field. Um, it will be helpful to write down at least one element of this field, which I'll call p-tilt. So this is going to mean this sequence. I suppose this first element is actually 0 in the sequence. But in any case, uh, we have this element. And I, I can 
take the valuation on C tilt to be such that the absolute value of P tilt is the same as the absolute value of P. I'll just write the same symbol to mean the valuation on either field. Uh, P is a pseudo uniformizer for C, meaning that it's has uh, it's non-zero, but it has valuation less than one, and the same is true for this element. Um, the other thing I want to say about the tilt before moving on is that there is an alternate definition of it for C tilt. There exists a bijection. Um, Ah, in fact, a homeomorphism between C tilt and the limit of just C under x goes to x to the p. So I just could consider sequences like this, and I get the same thing. I mean, I mean, this would follow if you knew the same thing on the level of the rings of integers. See, see here I modded out by p and got a system of rings where the transition map are ring homomorphisms. This time the transition maps are just multiplicative monoid maps, but it's still a bijection nonetheless, and the lemma I suppose you would have to show is that the map to the way I defined it the first way, this is actually a bijection. So if you can convince yourself of this, then either definition will give you the same result. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'll pause here. Are there any questions so far on what this ring is? OK. So I've got the ring OC. I've got the ring OC tilt. And I want to just define um, the tensor product between OC and ZP in square in quotes. So this will be ZP tensor OC. All right, so the way to do this is to first convert the ring OC into its characteristic P tilt, its OC tilt, and then take VIT vectors. So this is the VIT vectors of the ring of integers of the tilt of C. Okay. All right, so this ring has a name. This is Fontaine's ring A inf. Um, it carries a topology with it. The topology is generated now by two elements, given by P and the Teichmuller representative of P tilt. So it's a two-dimensional local ring now. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. Yes. Yes. Of course. Yeah, so I've been reminded I should just use all three boards. And so there's that. And now I can start on this one because that's older. That's a good idea. Thank you. But if it's like this, can you still see it? Yeah, sure. All right. Sorry, what is the end of the sentence there? Uh, what is the end of which sentence? A and with its, oh my goodness, I didn't finish it. <laughs> I'll finish it on this board. That's fine. It says a int with its p comma p tilt attic topology. All right, so now it's a topological ring. Very good. Um, one other thing I need to introduce about this is, well, there's two things. One is that there is a so features of this ring. One is that there's a Frobenius automorphism on it. So C does not have a Frobenius, but C tilt has one. It just shifts everything over. And uh, that automorphism of OC tilt extends to an automorphism of ANF, its ring of bit vectors. So there's a Frobenius automorphism on it. Another is this theta map that I have to tell you about. There's a map 
theta from a inf back to OC in characteristic zero. And I'll tell you what this does. So I have to define it in stages. Up here I said, where did I say it? C tilt, or even just OC tilt. If I have an element of OC tilt represented by a sequence like so, then I could project onto its first coordinate to get an element which I'll call X sharp. So there's a sharp map from the tilt back to what you started with. Now the sharp map is certainly not a ring homomorphism, although it is multiplicative. So given this, I actually do get a ring homomorphism when I pass to VIT vectors. So I can tell you now what this theta map does. If I have a series a and p to the n like so, its image under theta will simply be sum of a n sharp p to the n. And the magic here is that this actually is a ring homomorphism. It's additive. The Witt vector operations turn this into something additive. So this theta map takes a nth and maps it to OC. Um, it's surjective, and we can describe its kernel. Um, the kernel is going to be a principal ideal. ideal. With generator Xi, and um, I'll give you two possible values for Xi. Uh, one is sort of obvious. So, I mean, Xi could be, for instance, P minus P tilt. So, if you think about what theta does, the element P tilt being just composed of P, a P root of P, a P squared root of P, and so forth, it just gets projected onto P under this sharp map. In other words, if I take P tilt and then sharp it, I just get p again. So p tilt goes to p, and of course p goes to p as well, so this lies in the kernel, and in fact this element generates the kernel. Um, Fontaine gave a description of how you know, how you can recognize an element of a kernel of such a map as being a generator. Uh, it's called a primitive of degree one. Um, but I just want to give you one more example of such an element. I'll do a little calculation over here to derive it. No, not here. <laughs> How about over here? No kidding. Oh, so I can do this. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to define um, an element epsilon in this ring OC tilt. So zeta p is going to be a primitive p root of unity, and same for p squared. And this is going to be a compatible sequence of such primitive p power roots of unity. And epsilon is going to define an element of OC tilt. Uh, epsilon sharp, of course, is 1. So that means I could take um, a Teichmuller element like epsilon brackets and subtract 1, and then that, of course, would be in the kernel of theta. Uh, this, however, is not a primitive element. It does not generate the kernel. And you can see this by noting that epsilon to the 1 over p, um, well, epsilon 1 over p is just this, this sequence. Everything shifted over to the left, and its sharp map would give me zeta p. So um, if I were to divide this by epsilon 1 over p minus 1. So this thing in the bottom does not get sent to 0 by theta. But it does divide, it does divide this element in the ring a inf, and then you do get an element of the kernel, and then this generates. Hi. So what are the choices involved here? So you're choosing mm. some compatible... Yes. So what exactly is happening? What is happening here? So I, made, I did make some choices. So zeta p to the n... Is going, it's going to be a primitive p to the nth root of 1. 
And it's going to be the case that the raising to the power of p sends zeta p to the n to zeta p to the n minus 1. So certainly some choices have to be made to construct this epsilon. Right? Um, this divides this. So it's just the sum of the first few powers of epsilon to the 1 over p. And this element lies in this kernel because theta of this is 0 and theta of this is not 0. So that quotient is another possible value of psi. And that's actually going to be more useful for us going forward. OK. Uh, no, no, sorry. Generator xi, and the, here are two, two choices for xi. They are certainly not the same. But one is a unit times the other. Okay. Which one do you want to call xi? Uh, I'll call this one. I don't know. That'll be xi. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, fine. This will be xi, and this will be xi prime. But then I may, I, I may make, some, make some mistake in the future about this <laughs> if I forget. <laughs> I think this will be fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So why do I need this? So I'm, I have an interpretation for what this theta map is. I mean, in our definition of Stuckas, you have a leg of the Stucke, and it's important to consider the graph of that leg as an element of the product. So the idea behind this theta map, all right, so now what do I do? I'm going to put this all the way up the top. And then I'm going to bring this ring this down. Uh -huh. All right. All right, some more quotes. <laughs> so certainly there's a map from SPF OC to SPF ZP. You should be thinking like, oh, a leg was a map from a test object into X. If I want to define a Stucke over X, an X Stucke over S, I need a leg. And then the graph of that leg lives inside of x cross s. And so now in this situation, the graph of this map should be something which lives inside of this product. Well, spoof of this product has now been defined as spoof of a nth. So I need something inside of this to serve as this graph. And the thing that it's going to be is going to be the kernel of this map theta. So let me call this xc. I'm labeling it by its quotient field. xc is going to be, well, the ideal, gen the prime ideal generated by xi, or in other words, the kernel of this map theta. So that makes sense, right? Because the um, a inf modulo its kernel is just oc again. And that's what happens in this situation, too. Gamma x is just a copy of s embedded this way. So this is necessary to define a Stucke with coefficients in OC. It's going to somehow be an a inf module together with some Frobenius linear map, which is an isomorphism everywhere except for this xc. That's what our definition of Stucke will be. So I just said it, but now I'm going to write it down. Okay. All right. Well, it'll be a ZP Stucke. Over OC with a leg at SPF OC mapping to SPF ZP. Okay. 
all of this in quotations. It would have to be a vector bundle on SPF A inf together with a Frobenius linear map, which is an isomorphism everywhere except for XC. We have now arrived at the next definition, which is of a Broy, Kiss, and Farg module, which is exactly everything I said. The Frobenius is the Frobenius on, yeah, so way up there under features. Phi goes from A inf to A inf. It's induced from a map on OC tilt, which is simply the Frobenius on OC tilt. That is, after all, a perfect ring. I, I didn't hear it. Oh, it's back here. <laughs> Oh, oh, ah, ah. So you're, you're saying, isn't this different from the char equal characteristic setting where Frobenius comes from Frobenius on the curve? Let's address that in this little box. So the definition of Stucke involved a vector bundle which lived on x cross s. So you had e living on this. And it's, uh, exactly, so, so. It, the um, part of the data, which was a rational map from the pullback of E to E. So what was this anyway? I didn't write it down, so let's review it. So this Frobenius really does come from S, and it's just shorthand for one cross the Frobenius on S as an endomorphism of the scheme X cross S, I suppose, right? So X, nothing happened on X. And actually, I think that's a pretty good analogy for what happened here. It, it fits because the Frobenius comes from the coefficients, which were OC, not from ZP. And ZP doesn't have a Frobenius anyway. OK. Other questions? Uh, just a very question, but here S is any scheme over F cube. Right. So here now we're taking like this uh, OC, which is like far from. Right, okay, that's a very good question. In Drinfeld's definition of Stuckas, you need to define a moduli space of Stuckas, which means you need to allow your S to vary. You want to be able to define a family of Stuckas. Why am I just defining it over OC, which is something very particular? Well, it's a stepping stone. We're going to start with this, and then tomorrow we will revisit this question and allow, have families of mixed characteristic Stuckas. But there will be a conceptual leap we need to take to get there. Others? And also the point, I mean, so in two terms, we can choose different points from this point. But there we first Yeah, that's true. OK, so the question was, you know, this is not so strict as it may seem. Yes, I chose this very particular C. But actually, I've now given you the tools to be able to define a Stucke um, with leg really whatever prime ideal you want. And other prime ideals, well, it turns out they will define other untilts of the perfect field C tilt. So it's true that it's, this definition makes it seem like the leg is really fixed in one place, but I've actually told you how to allow the leg to be something more general. Okay. All right. Um, now I'll tell you. Yeah, all right, all right. So, yeah, OK. <laughs> Where did I say? No, ZP should go over. Yeah, that's true. All right, so the objection was really it should be like this. Uh, but I think that'll be, start to be confusing, because then I have to say something like, the leg is like here. <laughs> so I didn't know quite what to do. OK, I'll leave the tilt here. I mean, you have to convince yourself that somehow the map to ZP tilt, we'll get into this tomorrow. But if you have some object and characteristic P, 
mor a morphism to, to something Z, spoof ZP should really be an untilt of it to a ZP algebra. And so such a map here really represents the untilt OC. Are we confused yet? <laughs> okay. Um, definition. A Broekus and Farg module is, well, clearly, well, okay. So there was a pre existing definition of a Broekus and module, and that's a module over a power series ring with a Frobenius linear map on it, which is an isomorphism away from one point. And the addition of Farg means that it means, means that we're living over AN rather than this imperfect ring. So, all right, so in this definition, I just want it to be free of finite rank. Although other definitions may appear in the literature where you don't need this free condition. Well, okay. It's going to be an M and there's going to be a phi, phi M. Uh, together with an isomorphism, and so that should be an isomorphism from the phi pullback of M. So remember that phi is the Frobenius on A inf, so phi pullback M makes sense. And I wanted to go to M, but it should be after inverting some element. And so the element I want to invert is, well, I could have inverted just psi, but in fact, the reasons I don't really want to get into, although you can ask me and I will do my best, <laughs> is that we're going to invert phi of psi rather than just psi. A simple reason we might want to do this is because if I were to write this in a way which is um, not linear but semi-linear, well, phi linear isomorphism, then it just looks like this, which is maybe more natural looking. Um, but a better definition would involve an interpretation of Broekus and Farg modules in terms of cohomology theories. Um, that is, you need this phi here to be compatible with the kinds of cohomologies that it's meant to describe. But, uh, so, I mean, this is kind of, we're reading off the definition of Stuka here, except this is not a Stuka with a leg at XC, but rather it's a Stuka with a leg at phi of XC. You think that now it would be better without it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but what about the compatibility with the prismatic cohomology and... Prismatic is without, but then you want it to be, mm. but the Durham. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So depending on your preferred cohomology theory, which I'm guessing is prismatic now, then you would write this without the phi. All right, well, I did, okay. In the interest of me not making mistakes in the rest of, I'm not going to change this on the fly right now. <laughs> what? Well, okay, I could have written without the phi's here, in which case I would need to turn this to phi inverse, which lives over here. So, okay. Yes? Right. Where is the group lurking? Well, if M is rank N, then the group is GLN. And then if your group is G, then what you want is a G torsor over the spectrum of the ring A inf. Yeah. Okay. Now what? Okay. Now I'm supposed to take this down. Uh, well, okay. Mm 
Uh, given such a Broekus and Farg module, I can at least read off some invariants of it, which are pretty natural. All right, so. And those invariants I'll call realizations. So let's first recognize that A and admits morphisms to various familiar rings. We've already noted that it maps to OC. And let me just call um, the kernel of this map is going to be a prime ideal. So that's the point of the spectrum. I'll call it XC. Um, it also maps to the VIT vectors of the residue field K. And then I want to also invert P. So I want to give a name to this field. I'll call it K with apologies to the function field k from before. This is a new k. And um, this homomorphism occurs because this is just w of OC. And OC has residue field k. Tilt. So there's certainly a map from here to here, because OC tilt also has residue field k. And this I'll call xk. And then finally, there's a map to well, I could just mod out by P entirely, and then I would get OC tilt. Uh, and then I'll call this XC tilt. And now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking I have a field here, so why don't I just put the fields here? So I'm just labeling these points by their residue fields. All right, great. Uh, great. So the first realization is called the crystalline realization. And this occurs at xk. So if I were to take w of oc tilt, it admits a homomorphism to k. So if I have a Broy, Kiss, and Farg module, I can tensor it with k and get an object with, get a k vector space together with um, a Frobenius linear map on it. So such a thing is called an isocrystal. So if I let n, well, here, I'll do the following thing. What if I took the pair m comma phi m and I simply tensored it over a n with k, with the field k. And OK, so does this make sense? After all, I inverted this element xi. But you know what? Under this homomorphism, xi maps to a unit. So, it's so you just get an automorphism a Frobenius linear, linear automorphism of a vector space n. So this is a k vector space. And this is going to be a map from its Frobenius pullback to itself. And then for some reason on k, we refer to the Frobenius with a different letter. That's just traditional. I call it sigma. And that's what happens to so Frobenius on k is called sigma now. And so we have a k vector space together with such an automorphism. And so this is called an isocrystal. It's something like the rational version of a Dürrené module. And these are classified by their slopes. There's a dürrené manin classification of isocrystals um, where the parameters are just rational numbers. So the category of isocrystals is extremely well understood. The other realization comes at the other end with this X, XC. So this is called the a, a, XC tilt. So this is called the Atala realization. And this is, uh, so I'll call it T. And this is what happens when you take the Broekus and Farg, mod, Farg module M and you tensor it with The ring of VIT vectors, not of OC tilt, but of C tilt. In other words, invert the element P tilt to get a perfect field C tilt. And now this is VIT vectors in a perfect field. And then I can simply take Frobenius invariance of this. So I take invariance under the map phi m. Uh, 
the result of this will actually be a ZP module of the same rank as the A in Frank of M. There are enough invariants after you pass to this larger ring. And I think I want to, I was going to justify why this is so, but I think I'd better move on from this. The key word would be um, Art and Schrei or Witt theory. That is, um, if I have a perfect ring, I can classify modules over its Witt vectors together with a Frobenius map. And that category is equivalent to the category of etal covers of that ring. But in this case, the ring is just an algebraically closed field. So all of those etal covers are split. And so that's, that's why you'd get this T, which captures what's going on here. All right, so I've called these realizations crystalline and etal. So this maybe should remind you of motives. And indeed, a Broikis and Farg module is something like a motive over, the field, over, over ZP, in a sense has these, uh, or sorry, over OC, has these realizations. Um, all right, so far so good. All right, 12.05, all right. I think I'd better move on to part three, <laughs> if I am to finish on time. None. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I should say something. It's simply a free <coughs> ZP module. So of the same rank as what you started with. And I think that makes sense. If I have, an ob if I have a, scheme a formal scheme over OC, over OC, it's a tall cohomology is just a ZP module. It doesn't have any interesting Galois action. But this might change if I replace, if I try to replace OC with something else, then that would change. I'm um, doing it this way. All right. So, so far, we've defined, we have a pretty good definition of what a Stuka should be in mixed characteristic. But in order to, well, we have various goals in mind. We want to make contact with the world of Rapoport zinc spaces and formal groups. And then also this new object, Bungie, which will be introduced by Farg and Schultz. Uh, and for that, we actually need to descend this whole story to something like A inf modulo Frobenius. So this is what we try to do. Um, yeah, it's a great time for this to fall asleep. Great. Uh -huh. Where's the button that wakes up? There it is. <laughs> Great. <laughs> mm -hmm. So our goal is to, I want to recast the definition of a ZP Stücke in terms of, OK, some more scare quotes. All right, so a, a Stücke, really in any context, is a vector bundle together with a Frobenius linear map from it to itself, maybe with some zeros and poles. And that's something like an object which lives on the quotient. Um, it should be a vector bundle on this quotient together with some data. And the reason you might want to pass to this quotient is because, well, one reason is that you want to make contact with the world of geometric Langlands, which is objects living on a curve, like vector bundles on a curve, there is no Frobenius in that story. If I want to remove Frobenius from the story, I should consider what this quotient is. So this quotient does not make sense as written. I mean, you might think like, oh, it's Frobenius, it's spoof of Frobenius invariance of AINF, but that ring is not very interesting. It's just ZP again. So I have to do something more, less trivial. So I can phrase this in terms of some problems, which is that, the action of phi on the spectrum of that ring has some fixed points. So xc tilt and xk are both fixed. Uh, 
so one solution might simply be to remove those two points, which would correspond to, remember what xk and xc tilt are. So for xk, I should be inverting p tilt, and then xk no longer belongs to the spectrum. And then for c tilt, I should invert p, and then that just gets rid of both of those points. So that's fine. And so phi still acts on this ring, so maybe I should consider the quotient by phi to the z. But unfortunately, that's not good enough either. And I'll try to tell you why. So I mean, if I'm trying to quotient the spectrum of this ring by phi, then I would hope that the orbits, well, the problem is like orbits are dense. And so you wouldn't want to take the quotient if the orbit of phi to the z is dense in here. So I'm going to just issue this as another problem. If I look at this point xc, and I certainly do not want to remove the point xc, that should stay, but the phi orbit of this point is dense in the spectrum of this ring. And that's definitely going to be a problem if I want to just take the quotient by it. And so let me just emphasize in the Zariski topology. And all of this is just to motivate the fact that we should not be using the Zariski topology for the spectrum of this ring. In fact, we're going to use the attic topology. The sp attic of this ring will solve this problem. But first, let me just say, well, by means of an example, like what's going on with this statement? Why is the phi orbit dense? So if you translate this, density in the Zariski topology would mean that there's no element other than 0 such that f has a 0 at phi to the n of xc for all n in z. So it's a question of constructing elements with prescribed zeros. It's almost like complex analysis or something. We can come close, though. Um, where does this thing want to rest? Oof. So as an example, let's consider the element epsilon minus 1. So theta of this was 0. So this has a 0. at xc, um, because theta of epsilon is 1. But you know what? Theta of epsilon to the p is also 1, and to the p squared and all that. All of the Frobenius translates give you 0 under theta as well. So that means that this element has a 0 at xc, and also phi of xc, and phi squared of xc, and so forth. So it has half. <laughs> <laughs> Half of the zeros you want, um, but not the one, but not these other ones. So the inverse, the squared, and so forth. Okay, and so the issue is that theta of epsilon to the one over p n. Well, it's just zeta p n. It's not equal to. It's not equal to one. So that's fine. Um, if I were to try to remedy the situation, <laughs> I mean, it reminds me so much of complex analysis. This is like a gamma function, it's, or maybe the inverse gamma function. It's got zeros at half the integers. And then I want, but I want something like the sine function, which has a zero at all of the integers. All right, how do I remedy the situation? Well, I've got, um, you know, theta of epsilon is one. How do I turn roots of unity, in piatic analysis, how do I turn roots of unity p power roots of unity into 1. Is there a power series that converts all p power roots of unity to 1? It is. It's the piadic logarithm. So I should just take the piadic logarithm of epsilon, and that's going to be such an element. And this is Fontaine's element t. It's like the analog of 2 pi i in piadic Hodge theory. Um, what's next? Oh, yeah. Well, since this is part of this example, maybe I'll just do this. Hmm. 
I'll even give you like a. I mean, from calculus, this is this is true. <laughs> uh, I mean, you also wanted something like this because this has a zero at the negative powers, the negative translates of xc out to n, and you really wanted something which had a zero at every translate, so some limit like this would make sense. But this limit doesn't exist in an. I mean, not even, I mean, inverting p, would, you need to invert p to even write the series down, but it, it still doesn't converge in here. You need to take some kind of completion of this ring to get convergence. That completion is a certain Frechet completion with respect to a family of norms. And this is how Farg and Fontaine first wrote it down. Well, Fontaine's element T lives in various rings in piatic Hodge theory, all of which are derived from A-inf. Um, but this whole motivation was to get you to think in terms of the attic space associated to A-inf and not its Zariski spectrum. Okay. So the way we proceed is to consider instead... Hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in here? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Let's back this up here. All right, so the lesson of this previous example is that we need to use a different topology than the Zariski topology to address this issue. And so a good topology is the attic topology. So this has many more points. <laughs> so this is a set of all continuous evaluations on a inf. And you can ask me more about this in the Q&A session. But I want to just write down some points of this. of this attic spectrum. And um, they're going to be labeled by their residue fields. So for instance, xk, there is a map from a inf to just k. And you can pull back the trivial evaluation on k to this to get this xk. And there's something unique about this. This is the unique non-atalytic point. And uh, again, Q&A session for the definition of this. But basically, throwing away this point makes this seem less like straight algebraic geometry and more like analysis. We already know about these three points, xc tilt, xc, and xk. Uh, and then five is that I actually can define a continuum of points inside of an. So for all real numbers, positive real numbers, I want to find an, a point eta r in this attic spectrum. So this is going to be something like a Gauss point for a disk of radius r, so to speak. And I'll define it this way. If I have a sum a n p to the n, then I can define its norm under the Gauss norm, eta r, to be the supremum, okay, this part I have to get right, sup over all n of x sub n to the power r divided by p to the n. Okay. Right. What? Oh, thanks. Right. So 
Uh, so I mean, you're kind of deciding how big elements of OC tilt are relative to P with this definition. <laughs> and given this definition, you could actually retrospectively define what happens when R equals to zero, and then this doesn't matter at all, and it's just however many times P divides it, but then that just gives you xk back, so this would be like eta zero. Or you could make this R equal to infinity, and then only a n matters, and p doesn't matter anymore. And that's going to be this x. Nope, this is, this is wrong. It should be x tilt. Maybe like so. All right. So now some picture is emerging where you have this continuum of points living in spa a n. Um, so I can begin to draw a picture here. After throwing away this non-analytic point, the result is an analytic attic space and uh, <laughs> it's a, some kind of picture where everything is really arrayed. Well, okay. Let me just label everything correctly. So here's xc tilt on one end. Here's xk on the other end. xc should be in the middle. And I want to make things somewhat fuzzy around both points. Now, xc is not exactly in the middle. It's over here. There we go. The eta r's are going to live here. So as r goes from 0 to infinity, you have points arrayed along a line. Um, xc is not equal to one of these points, however. So I've written it off the line. And there is a continuous map just to the interval from 0 to infinity. All right, so this map is called kappa. All right, so whatever this topological space is, <laughs> it admits a continuous map surjective onto the interval between 0 and infinity. It simply takes eta r to r. And xc is going to go to 1. And I can even tell you what kappa is. If I have some continuous valuation on a inf, uh, as long as it is real valued, I can make the following definition. So it's going to be the quotient between log of what it does on p tilt and log of what it does on p. There. Let's say what the rest of the things are. The residue. The residue fields. They're harder to describe. Of the eta r in particular, um, they're really big. I mean, you would have to, I mean, yeah, you would have to complete with respect to eta r and then take, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just too big to have a tidy description. Does anyone have a guess, guess on what that would look like? It's just too big. It's, it's, it's not like xc, where the residue field is much sm smaller. OK. Um, all right, so we have this topological space. It admits a continuous homomorphism to the interval between 0 and infinity. And we have some special points within it. We also have this Frobenius map. And the effect of Frobenius is to take stuff up here. It raises it to the power of p, so it multiplies by p. So Frobenius multiplies by p here. So if I were to write phi of xc, that lives here. Phi inverse of xc, that lives here. Great. We now have a topological space with an action of phi, and the action is properly discontinuous because you can surround each point with a neighborhood which doesn't meet any of its phi translates. So that means you could actually take the quotient by phi as long as you delete these fixed points at the beginning and the end. So that leads to the following definition.
I think I have to end very soon. <laughs> All right. But that's okay. We'll finish with the definition of the Fard Fontaine curve and then just continue next time. All right, the curve denoted y. is what happens when you delete all points where the absolute value of p or of p tilt is equal to 0. So that's just the same as deleting the points xk and xc tilt and x capital K. And then, since phi acts properly discontinuously on this, I can form the quotient by the action of Frobenius. So this is this xff. All right. All right, I will take this. Next time, I will try to relate Borykis and Farg modules to vector bundles on this XFF, this quotient. All right, thanks so much. <laughs>